So it, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Ian Kern, who's going to talk about canonical forms in geometry and social theory. Yeah, so uh, happy birthday to Karen. Uh, I first met her, I think in 1976 or 1977, when she was giving a talk at uh, uh, Yao's seminar in Berkeley. And I found the talk was quite difficult. <laughs> 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 that was one of the best work about <laughs> regularity of elliptic systems. <laughs> and then she says, no one pay attention to it. And then Yao asked her a lot of questions. Well, then, you know, I, I have a story about that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm 80, I get to tell stories. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 thought, I, I, I thought that no one paid attention to that theorem and uh, there uh, was very little interest in it. And then one of the postdocs gave a talk about uh, something to do with formal structures, you know, and, and he mentions my, uh, the first time I heard anybody refer to that theorem, he, thought he mentions my theorem, but he also points out something I didn't know, which is a also that had proved it uh, six or seven years uh, before. So it wasn't even my best theorem. Was it even my best theorem? <laughs> So anyway, then we post uh, was here at 1979 for the special year in differential geometry and the STL organized it. And we, we talked a lot of mathematics on minimal surfaces in three space form, but we didn't succeed, I think. But then in, uh, I think 1994, uh, Karen was asked by IAS to organize women's program in mathematics. She, she asked me whether I can help her, and I said, sure, because at the time, she's working on shooting a floor, and it's true, she think she see the connection gauge equivalent to nonlinear shooting the equation, and I was working on isometric immersion. I, I did the isometric immersion in Euclidean space of space form, and that is a, should be a soliton equation, but I didn't understand its Hamiltonian uh, property. So we both were kind of try to understand the soliton theory. So it's an idea that uh, we, we just begin to talk. So I joined her to do to, to, to the uh, women's program, which was quite quite interesting. We spent uh, summer, many summers in Park City, uh, and then also try to work a little bit during the two weeks here. But uh, then he we, we meet almost every year, and I was very happy that uh, we spent almost every Christmas season together. And so it's a lot of fun. And in the beginning, I give you some nice stuff, very simple stuff. This is uh, when we were uh, at uh, Oslo. <laughs> 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 uh, this is all three of them. Uh, the, uh, the and then uh, another photo is I visited her at, uh, we visited her at uh, Bozeman. We two took a long walk. It was very nice. And the other one is uh, when they visit us at Irvine, we went to Crystal Cove Beach near us. So we have a lot of fun besides doing mathematics. And when we're doing mathematics, we were very loud. I remember in 1979, <laughs> one day, I think uh, uh, Langham came in. <laughs> Look at us. And we have to slow down. He slammed on the door. <laughs> So, so that's it. I give you some fun <laughs> in the beginning of my talk. And then I want to start very elementary and very classical. So I want to talk about canon canonical forms, which means it's a slice of a group action, which we already heard about it in the last talk. And uh, of the first one I talk is very classical. It's uh, how we use the canonical for theorem to canonical forms to inspire works in submanifold geometry. And then uh, the second one is very classical too. You use a group action. If your PDE has a, is invariant under a group, you can use uh, reduce variable, reduction of variable to find the invariant solutions. And that is a lot of times the first set of concrete solution you can find. And the third one is, uh, seems has nothing to do with the first two, but it's uh, the, when we study the Frenet frame, frame and the principal curvature frame of curves in three space, that is a canonical form theorem. You find the differential invariance and uh, in a homogeneous space, that's a, a typical canonical form theorem. 
And the last one is also soliton equations and integrable curve flows. That is, again, has a lot to do with the canonical forms here. So that's uh, the outline of my talk. So first, I would like to explain from the 1960s, uh, Palais did the, the definition of uh, a slice. So if I G acting on manifold M, H is a subgroup of G. We say you have a, uh, a sub code, you have a sub manifold S, we call it a H slice. If uh, the orbits through the S covers an open set of a M, and the second one is if the orbit come back, uh, the H leave the S invariant. The, the third one is uh, I have a typo. Sorry, no matter what I do, I have a typo. This one is not. So if you have an orbit through S and come back to S, then that has to be moved by uh, by by an element in H. So maybe the simplest example is uh, say in in R two. You have a SO2 action, the rotation. This is the origin. Then we see the orbit meets this line. So this R cross zero is a slice and uh, it come back at the reflection. So it's a Z2 slice. So that's the simplest kind. And then the second kind is also classical. We learned in uh, undergraduate linear algebra course is SON acting on N by N symmetric matrices. Then we know we can always find the SO matrix so that it conjugate to a diagonal matrix. So this, the space of diagonal matrix is a meets any orbit. And when it comes back, if an orbit through this point comes back, it just by rotate the uh, permute the, the diagonals. So this is a SN slice. But probably I forgot to add, mention the simplest, another big class, which is very nice, is you have SUN. Acts on the Lie algebra is UN by conjugation. So the adjunct action. And again, the diagonal matrix form a SN uh, slice. So this so in general, the slice a lot of times not global. But these two examples, the slice are global, means they meet every orbit and they are closed. So they have another property, is the orbit, the the principal orbit meet the, the slice orthogonally. So that's very special. And uh, should I? Yeah, you lift the board. Please. Oh, okay. Thank you. So that's, uh, that's, so this property make us uh, in 1985, long time ago, we call a isometric G action on a manifold polar. If you can find a close some manifold S that meets all orbits, but also meet orthogonally. So, and we call such a slice a section. So this is a global uh, slice. And the example, why is the agile action of uh, any agile action of a company group say on its lead in algebra. This one is a polar. And then more generally, if you have a symmetric space, then the isotropic group K acting on the tangent space of the uh, symmetric space, that's the slice representation. And that is also a polar representation. And then also in the symmetric space theory, you can find the maximum abelian subspace in P. And this A is a W slice and W is the wild group associated to the symmetric space theory. So, in this case, the uh, dot, the first one is kind of easy to check. The second one is more uh, is, is 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 a good, very nice result of Dadog in eighty five. He, he proves that if you have a polar represent orthogonal polar, polar representation, then the orbit foliation, the foliation given by the orbits, principal orbits and singular orbits, they they may not come from, they may not given by a representation like this, but their orbit foliation has to be coming from here. So it means for polar representation, basically these are the other, other representations if you're interested only in the orbit uh, structure. So then the examples I gave are of this type. And then this part, the, this principal orbit of this, Representations you can think is uh, actually on the 
isometric action on the sphere. And the, what happened is the special property, the principle of it, the, the, print, the normal bundle is flat. And then also the second, fund, second, second fundamental form is equivalent on the orbit. Therefore, principal curvatures are uh, constant along parallel normal field. So in 19, when we studied the polar actions, I, we saw, I saw this property. So I thought, what happened if I just have orbit have these two property? What can we say? And uh, uh, as I say, principal orbit of a polar represent polar action or I say inside so parametric. And so the, this definition for hypersurface is actually given by Ali Katan a uh, long time ago. So uh, this slide just says, I didn't have a group. I just have a submanifold so that the normal bundle is the parallel. And uh, if you take a parallel normal field, the principal curvature along them are constant. Just with this property, actually, you can build a, a parallel submanifold. I mean, usually they become singular and bad when you go to focal points. But of, because this is strong geometric property, all those parallel manifold, when they collapse, they collapse nicely to become still a submanifold, but have a lower dimension, and they form a really nice foliation, which is similar to a polar foliation, foliation of a polar repeat, uh, polar action. They also have a, so you can see, I'm just imitate what happened to the isotropy representation of a symmetric space. You can also build a wire group from this geometric construction. And uh, there is a Chevrolet restriction theorem for symmetric spaces. But, and that also can generalize to here. So basically, we are, uh, I was just trying to see how far I can go for this kind of a manifold. And they are really like the principal orbit of, uh, uh, of, of an isotropic representation of symmetric space. Maybe I should also point out this, this action, the, princ the principal orbit are the complex flag manifold, and the, the one on the real symmetry space, the principal orbit are the flag manifold of Rn. So those are the very model, model examples. And in here, I also use the wire group. I actually build a, a building-like structure for the, for the space. And uh, so the next slide, it's, uh, if it's irreducible, means they don't split into product of two of them, then the parallel foliation is given by a slice representation, but uh, the co-dimension has to be bigger than equal to two in the sphere. So, so but in co-dimension one, there are infinite many families of inhomogeneous examples. And then there are quite a lot of works in the later years about instead of study a one sub manifold with that two property, they study if you have a parallel foliation which behaves well, what can you say? And then they can also uh, prove a lot of similar geometric property as the polar actions. So those are the uh, development of this. Uh, so the, the, the second part is, uh, is everyone knows about it. If you have a action with H slice, then when you want to construct the invariant solution on M, often it becomes a question of, of a PDE on the slice S on invariant on the H. So if you have many variables in M, M but then if your slice is very small, then the problem becomes many fewer variables. In particular, if the action you have is transitive, then your PDE becomes an algebraic function. And if the principal is called dimension one, then the reduced equation becomes an ODE. Uh, but um, it may not be the easy to solve the, because you have a singularity, you have a singular points. So the most well-known example is Schwarz, Schwarz show, uh, solution for Einstein equation that uh, assume SO3 invariant. And then the second one is Xiang and Nelson. He, they use the isotropic representation of rank two symmetry space. So that is the cohomogeneity one repeat, uh, polar action on, S on the sphere. And they use this, uh, the, the minimal surface equation for the invariant solution become uh, ODE and they were able to construct a lot of uh, uh, surface, minimal surfaces in sphere with this uh, uh, reduction of variable method. 
And then also uh, Karen in 1982, he stu she studied the S1 invariant harmonic maps on two sphere into S2n. And then she showed that this uh, is a integral, complete integrable Hamiltonian system. Actually, it was the same system uh, studied by Moser on uh, Hamiltonian system. And she obtained a different set of complete, com complete set of uh, commuting conservation laws. Uh, later, she also proved that uh, the harmonic maps into from two sphere to UN to unitary group really is an integrable system, has many, it's almost, it's, it's not Hamiltonian, but it has many similar properties. Uh, and also, we know now that I think by other people prove that from two sphere harmonic maps from two sphere to uh, to arbitrary compact group is also an uh, integrable system. <coughs> then maybe I switch to this. Uh, so it's very natural to see if uh, if I have a isoparametric manifold in sphere, and uh, if I consider flow, mean curvature flow, then it's quite easy to see from geometry. The mean curvature flow was when you start with the isoparametric manifold, it will stay in the isoparametric manifold. So again, the problem becomes an ODE with the singularity. And so Xiaobo uh, Liu and I proved in 2009 that uh, all these flows will collapse in finite time and there's a type two singularity. But then in our proof, actually, we didn't think about, we didn't even know about ancient solution. The, the one we have is actually, is an ancient solution, means that the negative infinity, it, it goes to a minimal one. And then also this is quite interesting is the, the, the mean, mean curvature flow, if you start with a principal orbit, it collapses to a, to, a, to a singular one, but then you can go a lower dimension, mean curvature flow, it flows again in that dimension, and then keep on going in the end, go to a minimum, very low dimension. So the structure of the mean curvature flow for this set, this family of some manifolds um, uh, is very explicit. Uh, I mean, not explicit solution, but the, the uh, portrait, the, how do you call that? The face portrait is very, very clear what's going on. And, and then in this year that Liu and the Xiaobo Liu and the Radashi, they proved this also true for yeah. polar action on any symmetric space. So maybe the rest of my talk more likely um, flows on flag manifolds. So this we, we already have a, a mean curvature flow, which on this, you can consider flag manifolds. We have mean curvature flow on flag manifolds and we understand how, we, how are they, how would they behave. Ah, sorry, maybe I'm, <laughs> so the, the third one I talk about is, uh, uh, differential invariants or curvatures of curves in a homogeneous space. So now if you if we have a homogeneous space, uh, G acting on M transitively, and I so the whole manifold is just the G OB at P now. And then A if H is a subgroup of isotropic group, then we say V, if we choose, if we, there is a V which is an affine surface subspace of the Lie algebra and the smooth map from R to G, such that the curve you give, it's moved by G, the map G. Uh, and then G inverse GX should lie in that subspace V, affine space V. And the moreover, if you have another map G satisfy that condition, then the G1 has to differ by G with a constant in that group H. So this, uh, this looks very strange, but I give you example, then you see, um, maybe before I give you example, the relation to canonical form is that if you have a G, which is a H moving frame along a curve on the homogeneous space G mod K, then the one you construct, the, the maps into V is a H slice, so H is a finite dimensional group of the gauge action of C infinity of the, uh, into, in, from C infinity K map to, to the Lie algebra, the C infinity RG. So it says that uh, to find out what are the canonical form, uh, what are the good differential invariants of curves in a homogeneous space become a problem to construct a good slice. So, 
And then the G inverse Gx gives you a complete set of uh, invariants und under the action of G. So maybe the example will make it more clear. So R3, the isometric group is the rigid motion group. So A is in SON and Y is the R3 vector. And uh, if, you, if we have a curve parameterized by arc length, then the Frenet frame we have, that this is SO3 and that is uh, uh, the, 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 the curve, then we in, in undergraduate differential geometry, we learn that G inverse, or you can write GX equal to G times this, then you define curvature and torsion as the invariant of the curve. So, so this, this is we all very familiar with. And this one is uh, the H, the identi is identity <laughs> H slice, and, and this space is your affine space, which the curvature space lies. So the second example is a parallel frame which you, you take, a, again, use the isometric group of R3, but in this case, we take the first vector to be uh, E1 to be the unit speed tangent vector, and E2, E3 is a parallel normal frame. So it's a parallel with respect to the induced normal connection. But then in this case, G1, G inverse Gx, I, I should have one zero zero here, I, I forgot, but what be principal curvatures. In this case, the principal curvature is depend on the choice of your parallel frame. Therefore, the slice is not, a, H is not identity. The H is, uh, you can rotate a fixed rotation, constant rotation of the parallel frame still parallel. So this is an example of a HV, uh, HV slice. And the third one is uh, when we study shutting the flow on Grassmannian metric. <laughs> with I study with Karen, we we need this frame. So if uh, the the edge orbit of uh, SUN on this uh, two distinct eigenvalues, the this is actually quite simple to prove that uh, we we find the uh, U UA is the uh, that group, which is isotopic group, and the P, so you can make it into P. And so we get uh, the, count, the number of invariants correct because you have K times N minus K uh, manifold dimension, and the, our invariant, there's no condition on the arc length, therefore you should have exactly the same number as uh, uh, the dimension, this many invariants. So this, these are the, we call the adjoint frame. And this one, of course, work for all the, uh, you can take any diagonal matrix, and then if you take this thin eigenvalue, then you get a natural uh, adjoint frame on the uh, frag manifolds. And then I give a more example. This example was SLNR acting on Rn minus zero just by Ay. And then now here, you choose a special parameter if the de determinant of the relative up to n minus one never vanishes, then you can change parameter to make the determinant to be one. So there's no T here, sorry. And uh, if you look at this definition, then you write down Gx, then you will find it's G times this. So such G we call a central alpha, central alpha moving frame and then the n minus one are the curvatures, central affine curvatures. And then also, I guess I do this because I wanted to relate it to solid time theory. So the, if I take a, a, I take a skew symmetry matrix, basically it's one minus one, one minus one and go on. So this is a skew symmetric matrix and defines a symplectic form. So we take the symplectic group with respect to this symplectic form. Then you can also, in this case, the curve we consider is that uh, the derivative up to 2n minus 1 are linear independent, but we want the first n vectors span a Lagrangian subspace. So this way we have uh, n conditions, therefore, our invariant should be, number of invariants should be 2n minus n. We get exactly n invariant, differential invariants. And in this case, you, you do a 
computation, you can we find these slides. So uh, I'm just going to leave that as this. So now, publish. Uh, we I want to start talk about uh, solid time equations. So this one, the Schrodinger flow. Schrodinger flow in general is. Uh, if you have, we, we want, we, we take the baby model. So R cross R, go to say a Kähler manifold. Then it's gamma T, is the flow gamma T equal to the harmonic, uh, the second derivative of this multiplied by the complex structure. So that is the showing the flow on Kähler manifold. But um, Grassmannian, the Grassmannian has a very nice Cartan embedding, which is the, the one I discussed before, which is the orbit uh, at that point, but it's sitting UN, Li algebra UN. Li algebra UN has a invariant form, just a trace by linear form. So you have an induced metric. That induced metric on this orbit is exactly gives you the metric um, Grassmannian. The Schrodinger flow in this case become very simple. It's gamma t equal to gamma bracket gamma xx. And uh, we, we actually we proved this in 2000, I think, but uh, we somehow had difficulty publish the paper because the first, first review say everything's known, but we didn't know where it's known. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> gamma is, uh, I say this because uh, Brendan told me about his experience. But anyway, R2 is a solution of uh, one then we can find uh, uh, at each t level, we can find the uh, adjoint frame. So in adjoint frame, then the curvature is given by this Q map. And the, but you can, because the flow is very clear, you can also compute the G inverse GT. And what you see is that you have uh, the G, there exists X the G so that this is true. So this is, a, if I put G on this side, this is a linear system. So if a linear system, you can write uh, the, it's, it has a solution. So you can write down the compatibility condition and the compatibility condition in this case, come up with the nonlinear Schrodinger, cubic Schrodinger equation. And moreover, so that's the connection. So in a way we, we say that uh, Schrodinger flow on Grassmannian is uh, gauge equivalent to the matrix nonlinear equation. And the matrix nonlinear equation is, uh, uh, so this is one part. If you have a solution of shutting the flow, you could build this frame at every level. You have to choose, because remember, you choose the frame, there is a choice of a constant. So you can choose that constant correctly. So make this is true. But conversely, if you have a solution, <coughs> in a shutting the equation, this system is always solvable. If it's solvable, then you take a solution G, then you use G to rotate A, you will get a solution of nonlinear Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger flow. So this means that you really can translate solution of nonlinear Schrodinger equation to the solution of a Schrodinger flow. So we use the techniques from soliton theory. We can solve Cauchy problem. As I mentioned by yesterday's talk, you can use the inverse scattering theory existing one to solve the Cauchy problem, but uh, we also use uh, loop group factorization, two, two different types of factorization. We can also solve the Cauchy problem. And uh, also you can construct infinite meaning, explicit, explicit soliton solutions, write down commuting higher flows, etc. Also, this is for Grassmannian. So a simple extension is uh, this works for any compact Hermitian symmetry space and they are soliton equations. So all this look uh, already, you can see some mystery here. You have a nonlinear partial differential evolution equation. It has obviously has so much symmetry. In it. So, so we, when we studied, we want to see what's going on, why you have so many conservation laws, commuting conservation laws, and the, why this all work. We, we have some success, but uh, the big problem we want to do, we can get nowhere. So. <laughs> Uh, so now, I, this, this is, again is what we learned in undergraduate. If I have a linear system, gx equal to ga, gt equal to gt, then that's a solvable means the compatibility condition, that's what we're familiar with 
AT equal to BX plus AB, but that can be written as this two operator commute. So that means you have a flat connection. But the last equation, I write this way on purpose. What you see is I have this operator, evolution of this operator is this operator bracket with B. So that is very suggestive because that's in literature is called Lux equation. Who Lux was the first one realized KDV has this property. So the complete finite dimensional Hamiltonian system and the solid time equations often can be written as a Lux equation. And how do you do that, right? So and also why, why you have so many conservation laws? But if you look at the simplest Lux equation, say it's just n by n matrix and the t derivative equal to x bracket bx, then you just do a quick calculation. Xk to the power x to the k power t derivative is xk bx. Therefore, if you take the trace and you take the t derivative, trace of the bracket is zero. Therefore, trace xk is constant of motion. So you immediately get constant of motions. You get n of them. So this, this is why you get, uh, if you can write your equation into Lux equation, then you immediately, the invariance of the, the operator will become your constant of motions. This is already amazing, but then in the 80s, there's also theorem by Adler, Carsten, and Sun, which they give a general method to construct uh, complete integrable Hamiltonian systems. So what happened is uh, they take a Lie algebra. Suppose you have two subalgebra, which form a is a direct sum as a linear subspace, but not direct sum of uh, Lie algebra. So we call such a thing a splitting. And if on L you have a add invariant non-degenerate non bilinear form, and you know that almost force you to be in simple Lie algebra, semi-simple Lie algebra. Then the L plus orthogonal of the space orthogonal to L plus can be identified as the dual of L minus. But the dual of L minus has a natural a dual Poisson structure, has a Poisson structure, and the coadjoint orbit is a symplectic manifold. So, but that's the first part. The second part is that uh, if you take a, a vector field from L to L on the big original L to L, if they vi C and the C bracket equal to zero, and this is a typo, sorry, should be G, G inverse. So vi is equivalent, then you build this equation to C T equal to C bracket with vi C plus. Then you can prove this is a Hamiltonian structure with respect to the Poisson structure on the dual. But moreover, if you restrict to a Hamiltonian, to a co-adjoint co orbit, then they become a Hamiltonian on, with respect, of course, with, with respect to the co-adjoint orbit. Here, this just means you take this element and you take the positive part with respect to that, uh, uh, that, that splitting. So this gives you a way, uh, did I say that uh, commute? Uh, yeah. So if you have many of these vector fields, then they are all commute, all these flows commute. And then, in fact, this VI really comes in the final dimension. You know, for example, if we take a, uh, this really comes from a add invariant function. The, this is the gradient of the add invariant function. But in infinite dimension, it's difficult for me to come to, class to come up with invariant <coughs> right away. So the vector field formulation is actually better. The proof was uh, originally is for invariant function, but it's work for vector field. So that's the really the main construction, and the, it's give you a really nice way to construct Hamiltonian system with a lot of conservation law. So I give one example that the total lattice originally is written in terms of exponential function, but uh, Flaschke uh, found out actually with the Adler constant sign construction, you can get uh, that one simply as this. So now it's, uh, L is SLNR, L plus is SON, and L minus, we choose the upper triangular uh, trace zero matrix. 
Then L plus L minus is a splitting, and the usual trace form trace is the add invariant form, and the L plus orthogonal space is the symmetric trace zero n by n matrices. And that's the dual. So you have a symplectic structure on the co-adjoint orbit. And if you take the tri-diagonal matrix, means a diagonal and then above diagonal and below diagonal, then they, they, that is a co-adjoint co orbit of this uh, uh, L minus. Now, if you take V cos C equal to cos C, then this one, it's a, it's a flow, which is the total flow. But moreover, the previous theorem says I can take K C K still satisfy those conditions. So K C K C K plus also commute. So now you get a, a n minus one, two n minus two n minus two dimension symplectic manifold, and you have two n minus two conservation law, and they are all commute and independent. So this is a complete integrable Hamiltonian system. And in fact, in the eighties, I think Adler and the Ramabaka and also Tian Shantansky. They use this method, they and they use loop algebra, they were able to write down almost every finite dimensional Hamiltonian system in terms of this scheme. So this is a very successful good scheme. And then how, how do you do it in infinite in, in infinite dimension flow means the PDEs? Uh, so in PDE, actually this we this is the way. Karen and I understand what uh, Drifter Sokolov did. So, if you have a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra, you take a, a formal power series, or you think is the loop algebra, uh, with coefficient in the simple Lie algebra, and the L plus would, would be the all the lambda i is positive, i is positive, and negative is the negative one. Those two are sub algebras and give you a splitting, and uh, the trace. You take trace, you get a function of lambda power series in lambda. You take the lambda minus one coefficient. This gives you a non-degenerate bilinear form. Moreover, the dual is itself. And uh, you look at the co-adjoint orbit, it's this space. So now you imitate what you did before, means you want to find the you want to find the something which commute. Remember it's Vx. X, X V X C C V C C should be commute. So you can find the commute. In this case, because you have this power series to help you, you can solve this two condition because we are on a co-adjoint orbit, co-adjoint orbit. So this is conjugate to the zero one. And so these two condition is enough to pin down exactly what you should have for PU lambda. And the, the AKS method will give you a family because if this is a solution, lambda i times that is also a solution. So you can write down a, a sequence of a evolution equation on the space of a, a AG that uh, they are commuting evolution equations. And uh, also because this there's a co-adjoint orbit behind it, you can write down the <coughs> simplicity structure, but also if you look at back, instead of taking trace this, you can also take other coefficient like zero. Then your, your space will look a little bit different, but you get another sympathetic structure. So what happens in solitary series, your, in the phase space, you have two Hamiltonian uh, sympathetic structure that uh, they are commute. So it's, they call the bi-Hamiltonian. So this, this slide is really, uh, I simplify it, but really explain how you construct your equations, the higher flows. So for this construction, if uh, we use the uh, if we use G as S U N and A is a uh, data identity I K minus I and minus K, then we get uh, the non the matrix nonlinear Schrodinger hierarchy. And uh, because of the way we can you construct it, so you could also read the Hamiltonian functions out of this P. So, so that is kind of explain a lot of the structure there. But then for, when did I start? Mm -hmm. uh, so when, for, for KDV, it is not this construction because if you, we, we couldn't find any A bound up plus B directly to get this. In order to get it, you have to 
you use a, a lambda plus b to construct a flow, but the flow will be on upper triangular matrices. And in order to get an interesting <coughs> KDV, you have to consider a gauge action that the equation is invariant, and then you take the a slice, you choose a slice and write down the equation on that slice, and that gives you the KDV. So, so that, uh, so the ACL2R, if you use ACL2R with the construction with uh, actually the one that was mentioned in the last slice too, you use this one zero number. Then you get a, you get a hierarchy of a solution commuting evolution equations on the space of upper triangular matrices. But then if you do a, find a slice of the upper triangle, the, the, the neopotent gauge action, and different slice will give you different look of equations, but they are all equivalent to KDV. So maybe I just, I won't say much. The, the way I did the, I tried to explain what are the central affine frames, Lagrangian frames, but those are really finding the, when we find in front, I say it's really finding the slice of uh, gauge action. And then we, and that's exactly the gauge action we need in the, in the construction of KDV type equation. So, and the, that two kind of connected together, you can study geometric flows in Rn, which is invariant under SLNR, which are integrable. You can also study on R2N, which is invariant under symplectic group. So they are many different kinds, but we couldn't do uh, exceptional ones. We only can do classical ones because to construct this uh, slice, it's- uh, we, were, we were getting somewhere. Uh, uh, we, we were getting somewhere on the exceptional one. Exceptional no, ones, yeah. We just keep up, keep up. Well, the end. <laughs> yeah, we need we to have a very- No, it's still not so interesting. It's interesting. a very good way to learn what the exceptional group Right, right. So we, we, we stop a call. We start at 20, uh, 1994, but we stop working in 2015, 16. Yeah, and uh, the main thing is we got frustrated too. Uh, the, I think it would be nice to get a, the exceptional ones because the PDE should be very interesting. Uh, the other thing is we were very ambitious in the beginning. We would like to see how KDV fit into the quantum cohomology theory of a point, and we 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 have we have nowhere to go. I mean, we under in the end we do understand how your solar action comes with uh, the stability. Uh, and the tau functions. And the tau functions. We have a very geometric construction. Everything comes from the previous slides. It's amazing. It's this. From this splitting, we were able to explain the tau function, the real solar action. And maybe there's some hope because I, I think of the literature says the, the quantum cohomology tau function that gives you the quantum cohomology is a fixed point of the real solar action. All of your solar action description is very concrete and symmetric, but we couldn't find the, the uh, fixed point. And is there only one fixed point? And if we find it, what, uh, what are they? Are they have a geometric meaning? We don't know. So, so too hard for us, so we both give up. But anyway, I think uh, I have a lot of fun working with her for we over 20 years. My longest collaborate. But anyway, uh, thank you and uh, yes, thank you for your patience. Any questions? Yeah. As a simple and provable system, if you just have G and S and Sun and ellipsoid with distinct axes. Can you is this the other package that when you're trying to control? Yeah, it's not so easy, but it's in the paper by Adler, Adler and Van Adler, they have a 1980, they have a paper. Almost every known finite dimensional Hamiltonian system, they fit into this scheme. But uh, the algebra has to be no algebra. Uh, no. Uh, 
I mean, oh, 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 yeah, the geodesic, the, the, the on SO3, they did a lot of those studies. Any more questions? Not, let's continue.